Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Wadier. And I'm Tommy Welling, and you're listening to the Fasting for Life podcast. This podcast is about using fasting as a tool to regain your health, achieve ultimate wellness, and live the life you truly deserve. Each episode is a short conversation on a single topic with immediate actionable steps. We cover everything from fat loss and health and wellness to the science of lifestyle design. We started Fasting for Life because of how fasting has transformed our lives, and we hope to share the tools that we have learned along the way. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Fasting for Life podcast. My name is Dr. Scott Wadier, and I'm here, as always, with my good friend and colleague, Tommy Welling. Good afternoon to you, sir. Hey, Scott. How are you? Doing great, my friend. Looking for a fun conversation today around a research article that we stumbled across. And uh, it is going to be talking about carbohydrates and how important they are to long-term success of weight loss. Now, Mm -hmm. before we ruffle some feathers, we're going to give you some context (laughs) and some nuance here. Uh, And then we're going to, as in in typical fasting for life fashion, give you an action step to walk away or a takeaway to walk away from today's episode with. And I think it's going to be a fun conversation and something that we have seen quite a bit in the fasting slash weight loss slash health world. And I think it'll be a fun conversation. Yeah, I do too. Uh, carbohydrates are, are, you know, like you implied, they're almost kind of a loaded conversation because you have, you have some, some serious um, advocates and, and detractors um, on on both sides, and then you have a lot of like uh, uh, there's there's natural carbs, carbs and unnatural and processed and ultra processed and everything in between. Um, so I, I think just just shining a light on on some of the things that are that are actually physiologically relevant and long term goal relevant and related um, is is just an important thing um, to to kind of help give some guidance there. Yeah, let me get the the bona fides out of the way here. So this article that we're going to be talking about and then really applying it into a simple application to fasting, um, a lot of the things that we talk about is insulin resistance and insulin friendly lifestyle being the vehicle that is combined with fasting, of course, that is going to get you long term results that you've not been able to get doing it the other way, right? Doing it the other diets, the weight loss programs, et cetera. And the power of this is that we're the the study really takes into account looking at blood sugar related issues, things and and metabolic diseases that stem from having blood sugar issues from diabetes to heart disease and all those other comorbidities, um, obesity, you know, the increased cost, uh, healthcare costs and more risk of severe uh, adverse health effects as you get into the later decades of life. But I want to start um, with where this study came from and where we want to take it. So this comes out of the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2021, and it's the impact of starchy food structure on postprandial glycemic response and appetite, a systemic review with meta-analysis of randomized crossover trials. Not done yet. The background says (laughs) starchy foods can have a profound effect on metabolism. The structural properties of starchy foods can affect their digestibility and postprandial metabolic responses, which in the long term may be associated with the risk of type 2 diabetes. The review sought to evaluate the clinical evidence regarding the impact of the microstructures within starchy foods on glucose and insulin responses. This is the key part here, alongside appetite regulation. So all of that word jargon, Mm -hmm. the cool part about this study that we're going to have a fun conversation around today, Tommy, was looking at the clinical evidence of starchy foods, so carbohydrate foods, right, on post-meal glucose and insulin spikes, so blood sugar, alongside appetite regulation. So that means the hormones that control whether or not you're full or whether or not you're hungry. And some of those things can be out of whack if you've got insulin resistance or blood sugar-related problems. Yeah, and this is... The good news is... I'm sorry. I I was going to... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. The good news is we're not going to break down the chemical structure of the carbohydrates <laughs> that they do in the article. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, yeah, there's some some dense uh chemistry uh going on in there, but you know the the more the more practical the reason why we're even discussing this is because, you know, every time we we go to sit down with a meal when we're breaking our fast, we have we have choices between 
which carbohydrates we're having, how they're prepared, um, how much of them are we having, and, and then their effect on, on actually how full we feel and what our insulin and, and glucose responses are. And then as we get into you know, tapping into those long-term fat stores or having blood sugar related issues, higher insulin resistance, and, and maybe even uh, type two diabetes or, you know, being on insulin and, and other medications. Um, these, these factors can be uh, important for, for the physiological effects. And if we're storing more, more fat, et cetera. And a couple of the things that they talk about in the article are the gelatinization and the retrogradation of foods, right? So This means how the foods are pretty much processed and then what the effect is of those foods on your blood sugar, which then relates to the things that you were just mentioning, Tommy. So um, the reason I found this interesting and the reason that we, you know, we, we, we were talking through this and we're like, okay, how, what is the overall takeaway message of a study like this? It's kind of blasé in terms Mm -hmm. of the effect. And we're going to use an example of, of, (laughs) of something here in a minute when it comes to potatoes, but the glycemic response or the insulin, uh, the amount of insulin that you have in your bloodstream, of course, the day, uh, across the days to weeks to months has a drastic effect on prevention and management of chronic metabolic diseases. And sure. starch is one of the primary food sources in the human diet. So if you go to the American Diabetes Association website and you look at the food pyramid and things like that, you're going to see uh, a, a host of six to eight, sometimes more servings of starchy carbohydrate laden foods. And Mm -hmm. one of the things in the fasting world, the low carb world, the keto world, um, the carnivore world is that the complete removal of carbohydrates as a macronutrient food source, meaning macronutrients, you've got carbs, proteins, and fats. Um, and, looking at that is the complete removal of one of these food sources. We find that very common amongst those groups, especially in the fasting world. And we don't necessarily subscribe to that. We did an episode on low carb diets or low carb studies, and they tracked people that had prediabetes and diabetes. And at the 12 month, 18 month and 24 month mark, the research showed that the results were actually worse on low carb for long-term weight loss and benefit Mm -hmm. to blood sugar. So it's the complete opposite of what we're trying to do with fasting, which is create a long-term sustainable lifestyle that allows you to have balance and not restrict and omit an entire wonderful macronutrient from, from from uh, from your meal planning from week to week. Right. Especially when, when it's coming from natural sources and then it's, right. it's, it's able to be put into your, your meal planning in long-term sustainable ways. And, you know, like, like one thing that that's always comes up for me, whenever people are talking about um, extreme carbohydrate restriction is just like, where are most of your, your vitamins and your micronutrients actually coming from? Because those, those natural sources of carbohydrates are one of the most potent delivery sources um, of, of vitamins and and things that our, our body really needs. We can't, we can't just get those from just uh, necessarily natural fats and natural, you know, meats, other protein and and fat sources too. So, um, I, I really like where they're going with, um, in this article, as far as, you know, trying to figure out, um, what's the best way to ingest them. And and is it important, um, that we consider the, the different ratios and the different, um, components of the carbohydrates that we're bringing in? Yeah, and the, the main one, and we're going to give you just a, a, a drive-by list of things and then a couple of action steps here or takeaways, but some of the examples of foods with different digestibilities used in the studies that were looked at in the meta-analysis was the difference between high and low amylose breads, rice, and pastas. And amylose is like that starchy component of the food. And then we'll <laughs> mention the fiber component here in a minute. Then you've got like raw versus cooked carrots or lentils you know, that are boiled short versus long-term. You've got less versus more gelatinized rice, coarse versus fine porridge, whole peas versus pea flour. Yeah. And again, I promise we're not going to go into those <laughs> nitty gritty details of gelatinization and retrogradation, <laughs> but um, the property of the starch related to the glycemic response and the hormones, it was, it was pretty boring as an outcome where it showed that 
the starchy foods that were higher in that starch content, right? They have a lower gelatinization and higher retrogradation, right? That, but the, the thing that the, the takeaway here is that they result in a lower glucose and insulin response. Mm. Okay. So starchier carbs and veggies and beans and legumes result in a lower glucose and insulin response. And the second part, which I was surprised by, were minimal to no effects on appetite hormones or reported measures of satiety, meaning whether or not you were full. Hmm. This is where I like the conversation about processed, refined carbs versus natural amylose-laden starchy carbs. Yeah, it, there's a there's a very big difference there because what, what they're measuring here in the study was um, – was differences in in natural sources. They weren't bringing in like ultra processed carbohydrates. There was no uh, no um, measurements on pizza or or anything else like that that we that we kind of find out there um, engineered wise. But when we're when we're actually looking at uh, natural sources here, um, you know that that's where that's where our study is coming from. Yeah, and I, so just simply speaking, so recently we got some feedback um, from one of our podcast listeners who was quite frank in the dislike of the fact that that on that episode, we talked a lot about food and Mm -hmm. there's no way to talk about fasting without talking about food as ironically, as ironical as that can be, because it's like, okay, well, what are you doing during your feeding window, during your eating window to make sure that you're getting quality foods to promote a healthy, you know, body composition and health Mm long-term? Well, the makeup of what you're eating is important to a certain degree. And, you know, we, we are not anti, we're not like low carb fanatics. If you're trying to reverse a metabolic condition like diabetes, the removal of the majority of the carbohydrates can be helpful in the short term, but for long-term sustainability, like we mentioned in those studies that we talked about in an earlier episode, you need to have some balance between the restriction and the omission. And so I just want to make sure that it might sound like we're fence sitting a little bit in terms of, okay, well, is it good or bad? And I want to make sure Mm -hmm. that we we, we really land the plane here in an actionable way that there is a benefit to having things like beans and legumes and corns and, and, um, you know, uh, natural rices, potatoes, sweet potatoes, uh, the more starchy veggies, vegetables. Yeah. yeah. Root vegetables. Mm -hmm. Right. Like those, that's actually something that we recommend if you're having um, some HPA access or some adrenal stimulation with fasting where you're having like issues sleeping or you're feeling kind of wired or tired, or you wake up kind of wired and your mind's racing. You want to actually incorporate some of those starchier vegetables into your weekly routine because they're going to have a long-term benefit. Just like this meta-analysis proves it's going to reduce your insulin and glucose in the long term. Yeah, you know, and um, it, it seems like every every few weeks or you know every time a challenge comes up, we we always have some people that that kind of join us or kind of start the conversation with us who say, you know what, I've been I've been fasting. I'm really dil- diligent with my fasting. Here's what I'm eating. I'm eating very low carb, so I should be continuing to lose weight. But I'm actually stuck at this plateau. And I have been for a while and we say, okay, well, well, what do your fasts actually look like? And what are you eating whenever you break those fasts? And a lot of times Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it tends to be that they've been very, very restrictive on carbohydrates, like even natural carbohydrates, almost kind of afraid of them for, for a long time. And, and what we find is, um, you know, a, a little bit of time of deliberately bringing those back in can help them feel, um, you know, more, more full, uh, more satisfied with their meals and actually get the scale moving again, uh, too. And, and, and once again, those are, those are powerful delivery sources of vitamins and other micronutrients too. So there's, there's a, a, a balance there. And, and again, we're talking about natural sources of carbohydrates, not ultra processed ones. Yeah. Take it one step farther. And then I want to, I want to, <laughs> one of the questions that was posed, uh, in the article review that we were reading is hilarious, Tommy. And I want you to, I, I just love the way that you delivered it about the, um, about the potatoes. Yeah. So one step farther is there's research that shows that GLP one, which helps increase insulin sensitivity, which is the opposite of insulin resistance. So you become resistant to your insulin, having its normal effect. So you require more insulin to process Mm -hmm. the food that you're eating. 
And that's like the light switch of turning fat burning on and off. So if you're constantly snacking and eating and um, having large uh, increases in blood sugar, which then requires larger increases in insulin because it's not as effective, um, there's studies that show that including natural forms of carbohydrates and starchy veggies into your feeding window, into your meal after breaking a fast Mm -hmm. shows to increase the GLP-1 which increases your insulin sensitivity. So it is actually undoing the resistance portion and makes your cells and your insulin work better in processing the food that you're eating. That's so, awesome. And, and I like know, counter, right? Counterintuitive or, or counter to the conversation that we, we oftentimes hear, we which typically is typically here, right? Right. It, so, right. So let's it, talk it, potatoes. It, I, I want to hear you're this. not restricting it enough. You know, keep restricting it some more, but, but oftentimes that it, it's already overly restricted and, and it actually needs to go uh, the other way to, to find that, that kind of uh, balance point. But I think that's really good for, for long-term because, uh, you know, like you've mentioned a couple of times, um, long-term data on extreme carb restriction is, is not good for, for diabetes or blood sugar or, or weight management because it, it tends to have this rebound effect. And I, I think right. that's because for most people, um, th- that's just not sustainable. So there, there tends to be kind of a rebound effect. I've known people in my personal, um, my personal life, um, to go down the low carbohydrate diet route, lose significant weight, but, but put it back on because it was almost like, well, I put life on hold for, for so long. And then when I started bringing it back, it's like, they, they just brought back too many, didn't know how to kind of balance that, um, weren't controlling like eating versus fasting windows at all. And then it was just kind of, um, it didn't take long uh, for, for it all to kind of come back. And it's everywhere. It's all around us, right? So the uh-huh. marketing, the advertising, big food, the grocery store, you know, we joke, like uh, I take my, I've always taken my kids, you know, ever since they were, could sit up on their own on errands with me. And then right. I would go get a coffee and then we go do shopping and, you know, a, a, a parent hack on how to still be able to get stuff done <laughs> while you have little kids. <laughs> Um, taking one is definitely different than taking two, by the way. Yeah. Um, but it was always funny because my daughter at one point, I think if she was probably around three, three and a half, where we went to the grocery store, she's like, Daddy, why don't we ever go down those aisles? Right. I'm like, What do you what do you mean? She's like, Well, the aisles in the middle, like those. And she's pointing at the, the middle aisles. And I'm like, Well, we right. do. Boxes she's and like, jars. But daddy, I, but daddy, I see, I see, I see, um, she called them treats. I see treats in that aisle. <laughs> and I'm like, damn right you do. And that's why we don't go down that aisle. All right. <laughs> right. Now, now we are not the, you know, we, we do have, you know, healthy snacks and we, and we try to keep that stuff in the control, right. Sure. To a certain degree. Um, you know, I grew up eating, you know, frosted pop tarts and frosted, you know, toaster strudels with the icing packets and break. So really dessert for breakfast. My point of bringing that up and to your point of the rebound or the binge effect is we need that healthy relationship food over long, over the long term and omitting an entire food supply for the long, I mean, a macro nutrient um, from our diet long term just doesn't seem sustainable for most people. So if you're listening, you're like, Oh, I've had great success with keto, then keep doing it. You do you like, Absolutely. There's some, there's some docs I follow out there that are carnivore MDs and they are pure carnivore and they are killing it and their body is responding. You know what? Good for you. The, the idea here is, um, you know, going back to the reason why I brought up my daughter's example, you know, why don't we go down those aisles? Well, because then you're more susceptible to it. The carbohydrates are, are there everywhere, especially around the holiday season. Like look at any dessert table or appetizer table, it's pigs in a blanket. It's, it's cookies, it's cakes, it's breakfast, uh, dessert for breakfast, conference room right. tables at businesses usually have some type of candy in it. And it's just hard to withstand all of that if you've got some imbalances and you've got some, uh, you know, some cravings and you're dealing with trying to, you know, get results long term and operating outside of the status quo or what we see around us, which is normal, which is, you know, 70 plus pro- part of the percent of the population is overweight and uh 42% is obese. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're 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 swimming upstream here and I think this episode will pro- this conversation will probably swim upstream for some people as well, but I think to bring a little levity would be the conversation around 
one of the takeaways from the study from some yeah. of the readers in regards to potatoes. And then we'll land the plane with some action steps for you. Yeah, I thought that was funny because, um, you know, what was what was implied here was that you you could go through some painstaking efforts to potentially, um, you know, make make the carbohydrates within these natural sources a little bit less of a glucose or a glycemic response, a little bit less of an insulin response, make it like a little slower within the body. And one of those examples was like ultra cooling your, your starchy foods, like bake the potato, but then let it cool for maybe three or four hours. And, and what does that do for the actual, you know, structure within the carbohydrate? And I'm sure there's some conversations, um, I'm sure there's some optimizations going on out there somewhere in the world where some people are actually doing these things, but to actually look at, at the effect that it's having, um, what, what was shown in the study was that that was maybe a 1% better difference by, by going through that, that painstaking effort, you know, to, to make the potato, like the optimal, uh, glycemic response. So, you know, in, instead of doing that, what, what I think would be a lot more actionable, would hold be. on, hold on, hold on. We 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 buried the lead there. So you're saying <laughs> you cook a potato and you let it cool for several hours and it's a 1% decrease in blood sugar response? Right, right. No, 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 no. I'm putting butter <laughs> on the potato and I'm going to eat a small baked potato and I'm going to know that long term this is good for me. Right. <laughs> That's craziness. Okay, carry on. Sorry. Land the plane here, yeah. Tommy, with, well, with the well, takeaway for today's message. <laughs> Yeah, I'd much rather not have any potatoes than have them sitting on my counter for three hours oh. and then eat it stone cold, right? Um, but, you know, what What would be better physiologically speaking and psychologically sustainability wise would be instead of reducing carbohydrates more, especially the good natural ones, create some more clear boundaries for your, your eating window and your fasting window, right? So put those starchy veggies, those natural carbohydrates, put them into your eating window. And if you haven't been for a while, introduce some, go for the next you know, week or two. And, yeah. Right. Like put some in there deliberately and, and get, get better with your fasting, not your carb restriction. And then, and then watch some, some better results probably come about and, and see yourself being able to do that um, even much more sustainably long-term too. So what I just heard there, Tommy, was more fasting and not more carb restriction. Yes, exactly. Okay. So that we did not say, uh, go, you know, eat three cups of rice at your next, next time you break your fast, right? right? So if you haven't been putting these things in, or if you're getting great results without it, then that's fine. Just food for thought for the future, pun intended, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, if you're struggling with it and you're going up and down and up and down and, and you're finding yourself not being able to stay consistent during your eating window and kind of falling off the wagon and still, you know, um, you're, you're really struggling with that long-term healthy relationship, then yeah, don't cook two cups of rice. Start with a half a cup and and eat it and then know that you've done something great for yourself, for your body, and for the long term. Again, we're not talking about that highly processed stuff, but I love what you just said there, Tommy, is more fasting and not more carb restriction. So yeah. I'm sure that there's people on each side of the fence here that are probably listening going, well, I don't really agree with that. Eh, maybe I do. So here's the take home message. Stay true to the fasting lifestyle. Stay true to your fasting windows and know that there are benefits to being in both camps on this. You just got to figure out what works long term for you. So if you're new to the Fasting for Life podcast, you want some of our free resources, you want to learn a little bit more about who we are and what we do. If you haven't been to the website in a while, we now have a, an additional free resource. It's an insulin assessment. You can go to www.thefastingforlife.com, www.thefastingforlife.com. You can download the insulin assessment, get on our uh, email list. And or um, if you're new, you can download the Fast Start Guide. Tommy, as always, great conversation. Thank you, sir. Can't wait to eat my sweet potato tonight with dinner. And uh, <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. And bye-bye. So you've heard today's episode and you may be wondering, where do I start? Head on over to thefastingforlife.com and sign up for our newsletter where you'll receive fasting tips and strategies to maximize results and fit fasting into your day-to-day -day life. While you're there, download your free Fast Start Guide to get started today. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Make sure to leave us a five-star review, and we'll be back next week with another episode of Fasting for Life. 